Excellent. It is time to look at the Word of God together. Are you excited? I hope you are. All right. We're going to start off with a little piece of history. Does anybody, has anybody ever heard of the Jefferson Bible? Raise your hand if you've heard of that before. Maybe a couple people. This is a remarkable historical artifact. All right. It is a Bible, sort of. It's sort of a Bible that was compiled by this guy, Thomas Jefferson. You probably heard of him. Um, he was a British citizen for a lot of his life, and then he became a citizen of a different country because he helped start one. That's the one to the south of us, the United States. And he wrote something really famous. What did he write? The United States Declaration of Independence. He actually was the one who wrote that. And we're going to be looking at a little quote from it later. Um, because we're going to take some, there's lots of positive stuff about this guy. He was, he was a man of faith in God in some sense, but he was not a Christian. He was not a Christian, actually. And so the Jefferson Bible is this really remarkable piece of history. So what he did is he basically took the Bible and he cut it up, literally with a razor blade. Okay? Because there was no, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't copy and paste the way that we do now on the computer, right? So he took a razor blade, and he cut up. So this is in the Smithsonian right now in Washington, D.C. You can go and find, this is one of the Bibles that he cut up in order to make his Bible, the Jefferson Bible. And so you can see what he did. The parts that he liked, he cut those out to put into his Bible, and the parts that he didn't like, well, he left them there. Okay? This is remarkable. Okay, and so here's, here's what it looks like on a page of this Bible. And this is, some of it's really cool. He did stuff that we do today. So what he did is he actually made it into four columns, and he's got Greek, and he's got Latin, and he's got French, and he's got English. So that part is really cool. He spoke all of those languages, and so he wanted to compare the Bible in all of those languages. The, the part that's not so cool is the vertical cuts, right? So he'll have sections, pretty much any story that was about a miracle, he took it out. He thought miracles could never happen. The entire Old Testament, well, he just didn't even bother with the Old Testament. He took that out entirely. And then anything that Jesus said that he didn't like, he just, he just skipped over that. Okay? Now look, at this is that same page, but now we're going we're gonna to zoom in here just so you can see what he does here. You can see here, he jumps from verse 14 to verse 38 right here. Verse, and it's really remarkable because at this particular point in the book, I grabbed this because what we see here is in verse 14, this is, this is in the book of Luke. So this is Luke 18. He actually put it out of order as well. I don't know why he did that. This is Luke 18 to verse 14, chapter 18, all the way up to verse 14. And then he jumps back to Luke 10 for some reason. But look at this. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Everyone who lifts himself up shall be put down. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The one who humbles himself will be raised up. It's ironic to me that immediately after Thomas Jefferson read the words, whoever raises himself up will be brought low and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Right at that moment, he decided to take a razor blade and cut the Bible, an act of exalting himself. We're all tempted to do this. Have you ever had parts of the Bible that you wished weren't there? Yeah, man, we're all tempted to do this. We do this in lots of different ways. Um, we still do this today. I was thinking about a couple of stories this week. One that I heard just this week. You know, so some things in the Bible and things about God are very hard to understand. We've been looking at a lot of those hard to understand things as we've gone through the book of Romans, right? Some of them are very hard, and sometimes you just wish the Bible were simpler than it is. So I heard a story this week about somebody, a discussion about the Trinity, right? We're not going to get into the Trinity today, but that's the idea that comes across very clearly in the Bible. That God is one, there is one God, and yet God is three people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Both at the same time, one God and three people. And that idea is hard or maybe even impossible to wrap your head around. And I heard a story this week of some people debating that, and then one person says, well, it'd be just simpler to get rid of it. Yeah, 
It would be. It would be simpler to get rid of it. So we still have this temptation today. Human beings have always had this temptation. When I was first a youth leader, the very first youth group that I led, there was a young woman who was wrestling. She's a teenager. She's wrestling with her with whether she's going to believe in God or not. And I remember distinctly this conversation we had. And she said, I, the hardest thing about God for me is that you can't see him. I just wish I had something, I had a God that I could see to worship. For a long time, that was the temptation of all of our ancestors, wasn't it? One of the hard things about God is that you can't see him. He's actually invisible. But, but that's a reality about God. He is not physical. Jesus has a physical body. God, the Father, is a life-giving spirit. Spirits are not the kind of thing you can see with your physical eyes. We wish that we could. And so she, she wished, and our ancestors often did. And we saw that in Romans chapter 1, right? Paul talks about how the human race, what did we do? Instead of worshiping the only immortal God who made everything, we made statues in the forms of animals and human beings. And we worshiped those instead. Why? Because it seemed easier. It seemed like something we could control. We could wrap our heads around. But here's the thing about all these things. Whenever we try to make God, so this is a way of making God sort of in our own image, right? Genesis 1 says human beings are made in the image of God. But we keep on trying to make God the way we would like him to be or in a way that would be a little bit easier for us if he were that way. So whenever we do that, we are thinking of a God that does not actually exist. Think about that for a minute. Many people have trouble these days believing in God. We've talked about how more than half of the province of British Columbia answers the question on surveys, do you believe there is a God? They answer no. That is remarkable. A huge part of the reason why it's so hard for people to believe in God is because they are actually thinking of a God that does not exist. The God that does exist is very complex, in fact, more complicated than we can ever wrap our minds around. And it's very hard to deal with him because he is God. He's the one who made us, and we're going to see a lot of the implications of that today. All right, so we are in this series called In In Invincible Life, the book of Romans, and we've been going through Romans chapters 8 through 11. And today, actually, we're going to wrap up one section of this series, we're going to come back to it later on after Easter. We're going to come back and jump into Romans 12, which many of you will know Romans 12 is one of the most powerful, deep, insightful sections in the entire Bible for how can we live in a way that follows God? How can we actually live the Christian life? So we're going to get to that. We're going to take a break and do a series that's focused on Easter and resurrection, right? The fact that God brings things back to life. But so today we're going to wrap up Romans 11. And we've been going through some of the hardest chapters. Actually, they are the hardest chapters in Romans. Romans 9, 10, and 11. We've been going through those chapters. Remember just a few things about Romans. It's a book about righteousness, what it means to be a truly good person, and how you can become that. How can you become a truly good person? The book basically goes like this, the whole book of Romans. Human beings abandoned God. We tried to make our own God. We fell, free fall, spiral into darkness and death. What's the way back? We can't earn our way back. We can't work our way back. We can't fix it. The only way back is by trusting God. That's hard to do because we have to trust him as God. Jesus died for us so that our faith would be effective, so that we had a way to get back to God. That's what the cross means. And we talked about having the right mindset. That's what these last few chapters have been about. Having the right mindset, putting our minds on the spirit rather than on the flesh. Getting our minds on God, not on ourselves all the time. If you had to guess what percentage human beings think about themselves versus God, what percentage would you guess? I mean, I don't really know. There's no way to, you can't survey people. What percentage of time do you think about yourself? I don't know, I'm thinking about myself right now. can't think about anything else. Yeah, so a lot. 
So how do we get our minds onto God and how do we get unstuck? So the big piece in Romans 9 through 11 that that Paul, who wrote this, is trying to deal with for these, these Christians who are in Rome is that God has allowed something in their lives that they feel like they can't accept. God has allowed, we talked about it last week, God has allowed their nation, their own relatives, their own family, their own country, their own government to turn away from him. God has allowed them. And they are having a really hard time accepting that. And it's got them stuck in their faith. And we've talked about how many of us have that same experience. God allows something in our lives and we think, he should not have allowed that. He's God, he has the power, he could have fixed that, he could have prevented that thing from happening, and he didn't. So he's wrong. What am I doing in that moment? What am I doing? In the beginning of this section of Romans, Romans chapter 9, we saw where Paul was at at the beginning of that section. He was overwhelmed with grief about his own family who had rejected him. His own family had disowned him because he became a follower of Jesus. They rejected Jesus, and so they rejected Paul. And he was overwhelmed with grief about his own nation. You remember what he said? He said, I could wish that I myself were cut off. I could wish that I were sent to hell so that my nation, my relatives could be saved. That's where he was at. He was in the depths of despair. We're going to look at the very end of chapter 11 today. And at the end of chapter 11, Paul is dealing with the exact same facts, the exact same realities, and he is enraptured in worship. He is overflowing with joy and praise for God. He is... He is in a different world. When you read this, you will not understand where Paul is at unless you have experienced the presence of God in this way. Paul is enraptured in worship. But nothing has changed. All that has changed is that he spent three chapters focusing his mind on God and the truth about God. And that changes all of his feelings. You see, our culture often has it backwards. We think our feelings are supposed to run our life. No. We fix our minds on truth, and we keep doing that long enough, and then what happens to our feelings? Eventually, our feelings will follow the right way. Not all the time, but they will follow the lead of your mind and your spirit if your mind is set on the spirit. Okay, so let's read through the title of this message, Your Thoughts. That is, God's thoughts are higher than mine. That's actually not from Romans 11. It's from uh, Isaiah 55, but I just keep thinking about that text as I go through here. So let's read this section first, and I just want you, as we read it first, to get a sense of the power of worship. Here is Paul in worship as he writes to you. He says this, starting at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths, no one can trace them out. God is beyond anyone. He's better than, we just sang it, he's better than anything. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Nobody's ever been able to figure out all of what God is thinking. Who has been his counselor? No one could ever teach him. Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Just what we prayed and what I was saying earlier in the offering Every single thing that I have, I didn't make it, not really. I participated a little bit. Hopefully I went to work and earned some money, but I didn't make it. I didn't make myself. Everything I have is simply a gift from God, everything. It's all grace. And then he says this at the end, for from him, from God, and through him, through God, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen, amen, amen. I imagine at this moment, as Paul has gone through all of these things he's been thinking about in these last three chapters and that we've been talking about for several weeks, as he's gone through all of these things and his mind has begun to focus on God, he reaches this moment. I've been trying to imagine, I've been trying to picture what this looked like as Paul wrote this. 
you know, most of the time he wrote, he wasn't alone in his room. He was with other people, probably his, his disciples, actually. They were all disciples of Jesus, but some of them were learning from Paul how to follow Jesus. And he usually dictated his letters, because actually at this point he's older and he couldn't see very well. And when he writes, he has really kind of clumsy handwriting. And it's actually a lot more intensive to write something back then than it is now. You know, you don't have like ballpoint pens or computers or anything like that. So he's actually got one of his guys is serving, serving as a scribe. And I imagine as Paul is going through Romans 11 and he's, he's saying all these things, and I, I imagine his, maybe it's Timothy or somebody like that is trying to write as fast as he, as he possibly can to get down all of this. And all of a sudden, Paul just breaks out into this moment of worship. He is transfixed. His mind is fixed on this God who made him and who knows more than all human beings and who is working everything to his ends. And No one can defeat his purposes. And I, I imagine him raising his hands and worshiping God. This, this part actually comes in, a, in verse. It's in verse. He breaks into spontaneous Hebrew poetry in Greek. How do you do that? I don't know. Maybe by the Spirit. He breaks into the same kind of poetry that's in the Old Testament. In Hebrew, he breaks into it in the Greek language. And he actually quotes two different parts of the Old Testament in this section, and he puts it in a, into a form that could have been sung as a song. He might have been singing this. So I imagine him just bursting forth in worship, and I also imagine him grabbing the quill from Timothy. I'm going to write this part myself. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Period. Even though periods hadn't been invented yet, so he probably didn't put a period. All right, hopefully you have a sense of worship, and that's necessary. The pathway into worship, do you see what worship does in the life of a human being? Paul had seen worship before, even before he became a Christian. Do you remember when he was still uh, a Jewish leader who was persecuting Christians, those who were killing um, a young man named Stephen, they laid their clothes at the feet of another young man named Saul, who would later become Paul and write this letter. He was there when the first Christian martyr after Jesus died, Stephen. And you remember in Acts, if you know that story, as Stephen died, they were hurling stones and killing him, and Stephen was untouchable. He was enraptured in worship. As he died, he was full of joy, blessing the people around him. And he looked up and he said, I see the heavens open and I see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. The best day of his life and he was being killed. Paul had seen that and thought, what am I looking at? I'm looking at some kind of other world. But now Paul regularly experiences this kind of thing. One of my questions for you today is, do you experience true worship? Do you? True worship is what you were made for, and it will overcome all kinds of garbage in your life. All that stuff, when you're really looking, you're really fixed on God, all of it fades to almost nothing. You want your problems to look like nothing? Just enter into worship. But the pathway into worship involves true humility. It involves accepting that God really is God. And that's the hard part. That's the hard part. That's why so many people don't enter into worship so much of the time. That sounds easy. Okay, yeah, I can accept that God is God. Let's take a look carefully at each of these verses and see exactly what truth it is that Paul is accepting at this moment. First, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. What exactly is Paul saying here? These verses are the kind that we often read over in our devotions and we think, oh, that's nice. And they're actually so deep that our minds fail to grab hold of what they mean and what their implications are. So today we're going to talk about that. What, did, what does this mean and what's its implication? What it means is that God knows way more than me, and I can never figure it all out. That's not possible. God's wisdom and knowledge are too deep to fathom. Now, that's a metaphor. What does it mean? Fathoming something is trying to figure out how deep water is, right, with some sort of measuring equipment. 
His, it, God's thoughts are so deep that no matter how long of a fathom you have, you can never get to the bottom. It's not possible. It's not possible. In Isaiah 55, so the title of the sermon, I said, your thoughts are higher than mine. It's, this idea is envisioned a different way. Your thoughts. So God says in that chapter, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. How big is outer space? Can you wrap your mind even around how big it physically is? What God is saying is my thoughts are that much that much higher than your thoughts. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't think about God. We should, and that's what we're doing today. That's essential to entering into worship. It means we're never going to figure him all out, even in a million years from now. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you will be alive a million years from now. A million years from now, you will still only know this tiny fraction of who God really is. Tiny what are the implications of the fact that we will never figure God's thoughts out? We'll never understand it all. There are many. One is this. We will often be tempted to remake God into something that we can manage. Human beings don't like to be out of control or to not understand something. Do you like those experiences? We are always trying to do this. And so this is, this is what happened. The Old Testament called this idolatry. Whenever you take God and you limit him in some way, often into the, from a particular form, a statue in ancient days, or into, you know, this is, this is what, what life is really all about is not everything God is. Life is really all about just one particular thing. We limit God in some way. Or we, like Thomas Jefferson, we cut out. Maybe we don't do it with a razor blade. But in our minds and in our practice, we cut out parts of what God says about life and about himself, and we just ignore them. We will always be tempted to do this. But we must resist this temptation. Why? Because as soon as we do that, as soon as we limit God in some way or we try to make him different than he says he is so we can understand him better or manage him better, we are believing in a God that does not really exist. The God we are thinking of doesn't exist. The God Thomas Jefferson made up who only said certain things in the Bible but not the rest, that God is not real. And therefore, it can, that God cannot help him. That was the whole, that's the point of the whole Old Testament, which Jefferson threw out, is that all the gods that human beings kind of limit the true God and make him look like this and just this way, those gods aren't real and they can't help you. You pray to them and nothing happens. You look to, you look to them for salvation and there isn't any. Why? Because they're fake. You made them up. But there is a real God and we all have to deal with the God who actually exists. This is going to get a lot more specific here in the next few verses. The next verse, 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? What is being said here? Now he says it in the form of rhetorical questions. What are the answers to these questions? Who has known the mind of the Lord? No one. No one. Who has been his counselor? Who is qualified to teach God what he should have done or what he should do in the future? Who is qualified to teach God how to run the world better than he's doing it right now? What's the answer? No one. God knows more than we do. This is very similar to the last verse. What are the implications of this? God's thoughts are perfect and complete. Those are huge words. His, what God decides, what he thinks through, what he plans, there is no imperfection in them. They are perfect and they are complete. What does this imply about how we are going to live life? Who could instruct him? Who would dare to try to teach God how he should do things? Now, the answer to this is a little bit different than the last one. I asked you before who was qualified to teach God how he should run the world. And the answer is no one. But when I ask you this, 
Who would try to instruct God? Who would dare to teach him how he should do things better? What's the answer? Every human being who's ever lived. Whenever there's a moment in my life where I think, man, why did God allow this thing into my life? And then I go beyond it and I say, God should not have. God should not have. What am I implying in that moment? I'm saying there is a God who made the whole universe and he made me and he is omnipotent. He has all power and ability and I'm smarter than him. I know more than he does and he, he made a bad decision. He did something wrong. He shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have let me be the way that I am. He shouldn't have let that person come into my life and hurt me. He shouldn't have let me fail in that particular moment. He shouldn't have let those, those people who I love turn that way and destroy themselves. He shouldn't have allowed these huge atrocities in the history of the world. He shouldn't have. I know better than him. When as soon as I have done that, I believe in a false God. I believe in a God who has all power, yet who is not as wise as me. That God doesn't exist. The God who exists has all power and his wisdom is so far beyond mine that I cannot ever fathom how far it is. That God exists and everything he does is right. Everything. It cannot be otherwise. Oh my. Next verse. If that one was hard, this verse is the hardest of all. Who has ever given to God? that God should repay them. What is being said here? It is impossible for God to owe you anything. And this follows. It is logically inescapable. If the God of the Bible is real, if he exists, if there is a God that made the whole universe out of nothing, everything depends only on him, then it is impossible for that kind of a God to owe you anything. It's impossible. How many human beings walk through life, at least, at very least, feeling like God, life, and the universe owe them something? Let's think about the implications of this. It might even be easy for some of you to say, God doesn't owe me anything. But what follows from that? If God really doesn't owe me anything, does God owe you a good life? Does he? Now, God loves you. Don't, don't misunderstand here. The message of the Bible is clear. God loves every person. He wants you to have good things. He, he is leading you toward a good end if you will only trust him. But does he owe you a good life? That's a different question. Does he owe me something so that I could show up in front of God and demand it? You should have given me this because you owed it to me, God. The answer is no. God does not owe you a good life. If from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death, your life was nothing but horrific suffering, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every minute and second of every day, which is not true for anyone, by the way. But if it were, would God have done something wrong? The answer is no. I want you to think about that. He doesn't want that for you. He doesn't do that to anyone. But he is not required. There's nothing. Hold. We, we often think of God like he's a human being because we have rights before other people, don't we? Let's think about that for a minute. You have no rights before God. None. Can that really be true? Why would that be true? Let's jump back to Jefferson for a minute. Here's his famous Declaration of Independence. The most famous line from it. Right? And this is, all of us have heard this, and much of Western society, much of our culture is kind of built on these ideas as, as important building blocks. And they are important. And actually, I'm going to say that everything he says in these lines is true. We hold these truths to be self evident. We can see it from the way the world is around us that all men, actually, all human beings, is what he means, because that's what that word used to mean in this context, all human beings are created equal. They are endowed by their creator 
with certain in unalienable rights. That among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you have a right to be alive? Does anyone have the right to just come kill you just for no reason because they want to? Well, no, they don't. Why do you have that right? What is the basis of that right? The basis of it is that your life was given to you by God. So no one else owns you, not even your parents. Because God gave you your life. So no one, no human being has the right to come and take away your life. But what does that mean about God? God is the one who made you. You have no rights before him. What about liberty? I mean, we've been talking about how God gives us free will. That's something he chooses to give us. He chooses to give us life. He chooses to give us liberty. Much of the time, we're not happy all the time. We could be happier if we followed him more. He chooses to give us happiness and joy. But is he required to? Does he owe it to us? He does not. In fact, already the very fact that we're alive is nothing but grace. It's a free gift from him and he is not under any obligation to make us exist or exist in any particular way. That's a hard truth, right? I mean, even as I wrote this, you have no rights before God. I mean, our whole society, just uh, people talk about their rights all the time. And it is true we have rights before other people, but not before the only God. This is why it's so hard to enter into worship, my friends. Because we have to deal with the real God. Not one that we make up in our minds who's there to serve me. We have to deal with the God who actually exists and who made me. Okay, one more verse. This is the, this is the worship verse in a deep sense. From him and through him. And for him are all things. Well, what does it mean? Just what we've said, that everything that exists came from God. It all came from him. It all belongs to him, therefore. In the strongest sense, everything that exists, including you, belongs to God. He can do with with everything whatever he wants, actually, because of that fact. Not only that, but everything that exists, exists through him. What does that mean? That means this is is the biblical idea that everything that exists right now is sustained by God, currently, actively. If God stopped pouring out his power and his grace into the universe, the universe would collapse and cease to exist. It all rests on him right now, every moment of every day. And for him are all things. And this is critical. This is the worship piece. All things were created to move toward God. To Him be the glory forever. What were you created for? Everything came from Him. Okay, let's summarize this. Everything came from Him. Everything right now is sustained by Him. And everything finds its purpose in moving toward Him. It doesn't mean that we're sort of like just subservient and he wanted a bunch of slaves or something. In fact, the Bible's very clear that's not what he wanted, right? We've been talking about that for weeks. He wanted people who would love him, who would be full of joy and full of, become more and more like him on the inside. He made us in his image. But our purpose is to move toward him, become more like him, and in that glorify him as we live with him. And so the best life that we can live The greatest that we can ever be is to be worshiping him, glorifying him, showing forth who he really is. The implication is that the best life is a life of worship. Today, a lot of people, especially if you got the younger lingo, people will talk about living their best life, right? And I even talked about living your best life with my, my dog a little while ago when she was playing fetch, right? We were throwing the, I was throwing the stick for Bella. I had a little video a couple of months ago. And she, that clearly, it's, it's what she lives for, is to play fetch. And then be there right in front of her owner. Is she doing what she wants to do in that moment? 100%. Is she living her best life in that moment? 
100%. Who is she focused on in that moment? Her master. She is not focused on herself. In a certain sense, though we can't fully say that animals worship, but she is in a sense worshiping in that moment. She is focused on me, or whoever's throwing the stick for her, her master in that moment, and that all of what she is is directed toward pleasing the master, doing what he wants her to do, getting the stick, what she was made to do, and running it back to him. She is enraptured in worship, and it looks different for a human being. It looks different. We just talked about it with Paul, but it's what we were made for, and the only way you can live your best life isn't by just, you know, it's not the same. You're not going to live your best life by playing some fun game because that's not only what you were made for. You're not going to live your best life by just having a lot of money and having a lot of pleasure and having other people serve you. No, you're going to live your best life. The greatest meaning, purpose, joy, fulfillment, and overflowing blessing to the world around you by living a life of worship to the one true God. And that's why we're going to come back to this. Oh, man, this is the biggest cliffhanger ever because this is one of the most powerful verses in the whole Bible. We're going to come back to it in a month, a little over a month. But this is why the very next thing Paul says is this. I urge you, I urge you, the thing I would want you to do more than anything else, if I could tell you to do one thing, do this, because God is so merciful and good. Offer your bodies to him as a living sacrifice. Make your whole life not about getting stuff for yourself. Make your whole life about letting yourself go, even unto death in lots of different ways, as an act of worship to the one true God. This is the best thing that could ever happen to you. This is your true and proper worship. Let's pray.